Hello everybody, my name is Nathan Lynch. I'm a Bay Area artist and chair of the ceramics program and glass program at California College of the Arts. It's a pleasure to talk with all of you today. I'm going to do my best to share some stories about Ron Nagel and offer some reflections on his amazing exhibit at the Berkeley Art Museum. Seems appropriate that uh, we're recording this at 2.30 in the afternoon. 2.30 was uh, the address for Ron's recording studio in San Francisco. And he used to have, maybe probably still does have, a tall stack of newspaper clippings of really strange events that happen in 2.30 in the morning. So I met Ron in 1997 when I applied for grad school at Mills College. I had had the good fortune of working with Ken Price at USC um, at the University of Southern California. And when I wanted to go to grad school, Ken suggested that I study with Ron. Ken and Ron had been really good friends since the late 50s, early 60s, when they met at the Ferris Gallery in Los Angeles. From the very beginning, Ron was incredibly generous to me. I met him at his studio in Bernal Heights, and he took me out for a fancy lunch and to see the studios at Mills and a tour of San Francisco. I think at that time they were still installing the new palm trees along the Embarcadero uh, out in front of the ferry building. Over the years, I've learned a, a lot from Ron about music and, as I said, food and teaching and, of course, art or art-related habits. I was his grad student for two years, uh, his studio assistant for three years, and even at one point his tenant. My daughter was born in, in the little cottage next to his house where I lived for three years. It was uh, a 400 and a 450 square foot earthquake cottage that had previously been the recording studio. Inside, none of the walls were parallel and they were all filled eight inches thick with sand to improve the sound quality. One of the things I learned from Ron was to pay attention to all things, to language, images, music, to gestures, all of it being rich and fertile territory for inspiration and borrowing ideas for your own work. So this would include the high and the low and the in-between. Uh, for example, Ron's happy to talk about how Giorgio Morandi or Joseph Albers or Philip Guston's work relates to his work, but he also made sculptures based on the shape of my dog Slobber. Now, as we go through the works that I picked out from the show, I may go on a few tangents because that's what Ron would do. He would call it a sidebar. So we're going to have a few sidebars here. Of the other things I learned from Ron, they, I guess they fall into about five or six categories, and I'll discuss those, maybe one with each of the works that I picked out from the show. The lessons don't necessarily have anything to do with the works, and that's something that Ron would say about his titles, too. Uh, in that recent video from his talk at Berkeley with Don Ed Hardy, he told someone in the audience that in a movie you never want to play running music while someone's running. You want to come in sideways with something else to create a different feeling, a new feeling. Okay, the first sculpture that I picked out from the show is called Fort Gang from 2002. Now, I have a fondness for this work because of that thin fin in the back from a thin fin series and then that curved appendage up front like a finger or a tail and I think one of the reasons I'm drawn to it is that it's similar to several works that I made molds for in the late 1990s. Uh, the one I remember the most is called Lobster Boy from 99. This also has a great color palette that I love where Ron kind of hypes up the saturation of the red by adding orange or yellow from that right side. And what he does is he sprays glazes in two opposite directions to make that faux stucco on the surface really pop out. The fin in the back has this kind of standoffish, restrained posture, and that appendage is curled up all tight right in front of it. So there's an opposition there. Then I love the little extra green at the bottom, which you might not even, even notice at first, right above the foot. And under that green, it's set off by this shiny purple foot that makes the work have some lift. It's almost like it looks like it's levitating. 
So for those who are curious about the technical information about how he makes things like this, this work is assembled from slip cast parts that come from about four or five different plaster molds. And the first lesson I'll speak of, I guess, is maybe the most obvious, but also probably the most important lesson I learned from Ron, which is that he has a fierce and really constant dedication to his studio work, which is something that I witnessed every day when I lived next to him and worked for him. I saw Ron use every free minute he had to go to the studio and work. And that's something that I've tried to fold into my own studio practice. Okay, The Bad Clown from 2003. <laughs> I love this sculpture because of the title and the layers of sexual innuendo in the form. Ron has this great story about all the collectors who wanted to buy this one but couldn't. Uh, apparently, it's suggestive enough to make some people blush. Actually, the thing itself sort of looks like it's blushing, but in blue. I like the symmetry of it. Um, the white highlights that make the blue orbs look extra round, and, and then what Ron calls the super drip hanging down over that matte pink base. The super drip is actually a sculpted, um, a sculpted clay form that's glazed to make it look even more drippy and three-dimensional. So the second lesson I could speak about, uh, since this piece has so much humor to it, I think to understand Ron you might think about owning the complete box sets for all of Seinfeld, The Sopranos, Stephen Colbert, Amy Sedaris, and Arrested Development. So imagine spending your evenings watching those, those collections, plus some Charlie Chan. That'll give you a sense of what's happening, at least part of the time, in his mind. So this is called Beirut Canal from 2009. I like this sculpture because of the range of colors that kind of subtly add to the overall tone. It's warm, but it's got this really disturbing center. The extra red and pink kind of complicate the orange, and then there's the, the odd green, which is on the really odd tab right in the middle. I think the imagery comes from a story about Ron's dad and dealing with a skin tab. So it's kind of uncomfortable to think about it. and. Part of Ron's magic is that he's able to take that experience and build this really exquisite object that carries that discomfort with it, but also brings along a certain beauty and odd ambiguity. Ron's ability to mine his own personal experience to find these unique, compelling objects that bring together humor and darker emotions is really unmatched. He seems to have a lot of stories about his family that find their way into the work. Um, maybe not directly, but they seem to seep into the work in different kind of non-linear ways. I saw the uh, Berkeley Art Museum video he did with Ed Hardy, and I gotta say I laughed out loud when he described his parents being buried, quote unquote, double-decker at the, at the cemetery because uh, when he went plot shopping with his dad, his dad was looking for a deal. It's that kind of thing that, that I think we can expect to see something related to that in his next show. Okay, this is Vanity Scramble from 2011. And I chose this work partly because of that little cluster of twigs or thick hairs over there on the left that we see. Well, you see that kind of linear uh, gesture of drawing in a lot of the work, but rarely in this kind of trust cluster. Like it's a uh, little grasses or something. I also picked this work because Ron uses this to describe Trump's hair in a video on the SF MoMA website. I, th I think it's called The Sculptural Language of Hair Loss. So in it, Ron starts by noting his own personal experience with male pattern baldness. And he goes on to outline some of the frequently seen solutions, including Trump's robust comb over, which he refers to as the scramble. Ron refers to it as the scramble. So other solutions include drug, plug, rug, and shrug, which is Ron's attitude, it seems, but he can tell you more about that later. 
Ron is really a, a master of formal relationships. So he toggles easily in his work between like shiny and matte, wide versus tall, loose versus tight. We often see like a very squat and wide form next to something tall and fragile. It's like a Laurel and Hardy setup. And then the, the, maybe the fourth lesson here that I picked up from Ron is that in order to find good socks to wear, something other than brown or navy blue with gold toe, you really need to shop in the women's section of a store. And since we were just on the subject of Trump and his vanity, I actually think that man would benefit from shopping or dressing outside his own comfort zone. Actually, I'd really, really love to see Ron take Trump on a shopping trip sometime and give him a makeover. If anyone out there is listening, let's get Ron his own, yeah, his own reality show addressing politicians, at least for one season. All right, the next work is called General Malaise from 2012. I picked this sculpture because of the restrained palette, and the, which is kind of a rare thing, and the combination of new materials. This Snowball series from uh, 2012 reminds me of some earlier uh, hairdo wares. And I think that's when Ron first started messing around with the catalyzed polyurethane to get that spherical form, the sort of mound that everything else is built on. I love how saturated, the super saturated dark blue drip in front of the chalky whiteness of the ball, and then that gold accent on top. In the image, you can't even tell. There's like a second gold below the top gold, and you can't really tell if that's just a reflection of the gold in the blue or if that's a darker gold. At first glance, I didn't even notice this pink rimmed hole under the blue black drip. It, it almost stays out of sight there. So, the next lesson I picked from Ron had to do with something that's really common for artists that are trying to balance teaching responsibilities with their, their own studio time. I was surprised to find that somebody like Ron, who's so intensely focused on his own work, could also be so available and incredibly generous and selfless towards his students. He was really invested in, in our work and our development. I also learned that teaching could be really, really fun and exciting. That sharing the classroom space with young artists and colleagues could create a kind of dynamic and positive and very generative atmosphere for making new work. And when I think about it, if, if Ken and Ron picked up any teaching notes from their teacher, it was Pete Volkus, it was that they almost always worked on something in the classroom. Other than that, they had very different styles, but Ken would be up at the front working quietly while we worked at our tables. Usually he would be like decorating a cup or a bowl. And if you wanted to talk, you could go up and talk to him, but mostly we all worked. Maybe we talked about baseball and politics. And Ron, Ron was also working, but he would be buzzing from one part of the studio to the other, making molds, spraying something checking in on students constantly, cracking jokes, occasionally mocking someone, but not mocking students. You know, he, he would be more likely to talk about music or TV um, and often, quite often, singing himself. The diff <laughs> I've, I've tried to take up the singing in my classroom. Um, the difference between us, of course, being that Ron can carry a tune and I can't, but uh, nevertheless, it's an attitude about bringing some extra energy towards the classroom. Okay, the last piece I picked uh, is called Message to Raphael from 2016. This is a sculpture that reminds me of earlier works uh, where Ron would take two similar forms and pair them side by side like he did in the Dick Tracy series from the, the mid-80s. There's a lot of tension here or maybe I'd say anticipation in the middle of those forms. And Ron just calls it out with a, a extra lick of gold right there. I like the abstraction in all of Ron's work a lot. Um, but here what I like is that I can't tell if those white vertical forms are 
like chunky legs or maybe maple bars set up on end or the split potato with butter. This is probably my favorite work from the show at Berkeley. And the last lesson I want to share, I guess, has to do with California. So you may or may not know, Ron was born and raised, lived his whole life in San Francisco. And I moved here uh, in 97, and it was early 1998. I was working as Ron's studio assistant. Uh, I think it was January after one of the big El Nino storms. So it was wet outside, but not exactly raining. And Ron's sitting on his back deck, looking out over the city. He's got his arms crossed, and he's complaining about the weather. It's like, this sucks. I was thinking about the freezing winters of my youth in eastern Washington, and in a kind of naive optimism, I said, you know, Ron, Ron, this isn't really so bad. There's a lot of places in the country where the weather's much worse. And Ron said, fuck the rest of the country, Nathan. This is California. We deserve better. One thing I really, really love about hanging out with Ron is that he kind of, he oscillates between enthusiasm for what he loves and his plain disgust for what he doesn't. So if he loves something, he's really, really psyched about it and wants to share that. And if he doesn't, he's going to be pissed about it and not afraid to tell you why. So I learned from him there's a certain value in taking extreme positions. Not all the time, but sometimes you're going to need to. He said this of himself recently. He said, restraint is really hard for me. I have a penchant for going overboard. Quote. Well, Ron, I want to say thanks for going overboard. The results of that kind of determination and lack of restraint has been a great gift to the rest of us. It's led to a collection of sculptures that are, are truly magical and totally inspirational. It's really been a pleasure and an honor to share some thoughts with all of you today. I want to thank the Berkeley Art Museum and Apsara Dikinzio for the invitation to record this and to Ron for his generosity and empathy, his support, for his unique vision and his uncanny sense of humor. And thanks to all of you for listening.